Uh, very good. I, I think really that that argument in in my mind is false, and I'll give you a number of reasons why I believe it's false. First of all, it's an argument that we've heard before. In fact, we've heard it extensively about the internet itself. Uh, the internet in the early 90s was seen as a den of pornographers, thieves, and terrorists, and uh, you know all kinds of horrible stories about how the future would unfold. The truth was that as it gained mainstream adoption, it reflected the desires and needs of mainstream society. Most people are more interested in posting videos of their cats uh, than using it to communicate with terrorists. Uh, the truth is that people will use Bitcoin um, to feed their families, to send their kids to school, to pay for health care, um, to get their payroll. Good morning, everyone. I don't think everybody woke up yet. Good morning. It's a bit better. Okay. So I, I, I have to say, I was promised a room with a view, and so far, everywhere I've looked, all I can see is mountains. So what's up with that? Um, that was a joke told to me by a New Zealand uh, journalist yesterday during an interview for Radio New Zealand. It was. Uh, uh, quite, a, quite an interesting uh, conversation. So I'm really uh, just amazing to be here today. Really excited to be here. Thank you all for coming, and uh, thank you to Fram and his team for putting on this show. It's not easy to pull a conference off. It's especially not easy to pull a conference off when everybody has to travel 6,000 miles just to get here. So um, just amazing job. Thank you all. What I wanted to talk about today is a new topic I've been working on about money as a content type. And the idea I want to express is that Bitcoin has introduced a fundamental transformation in how money is going to be viewed in the future. By making money completely independent of the underlying transport medium and turning it into a standalone content type. What do I mean by that? A Bitcoin transaction is a signed data structure that can be executed anywhere in the world. Now, a lot of people think that a Bitcoin transaction has to be transmitted on the Bitcoin network. And that's not true. A Bitcoin transaction has to reach the miners and be included in a block. But it doesn't need to be transmitted over the Bitcoin network. There's nothing special about the Bitcoin network. It just forwards transactions and blocks. It can be transmitted over any form of communication medium. And one of the magic things about Bitcoin is that because the transaction doesn't incorporate security mechanisms itself, because the security is in the proof of work that the miners do, and the digital signature that's on the transaction is put on there by the end user with keys they store. There's nothing sensitive in a Bitcoin transaction. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. If I go to a merchant today using a point of sale system or a credit card, what I am transmitting to the merchant via a long series of intermediaries is the credit card number, expiry date, CCV2 code on the back of my credit card. I'm actually transmitting the secret keys. I'm transmitting the access codes to my account. Now, that information is sensitive. If that information is captured, my account can be compromised. I can be charged again and again, either by the merchant or one of the intermediaries or any hacker who's taken any of this information from any of the intermediaries. So that information needs to be very carefully protected. If you think about it, from the moment the credit card comes out of my pocket until the money is in the merchant's account, it is transported across the network in a series of virtual armored cars. There is encryption from the point of sale to the merchant's back end, from the merchant back end, encryption through to Visa for batch processing and from Visa encryption through to the originating bank 
and to the destination bank, encrypting this token at every step of the way, because it is the secret key. If that encryption fails at any point in the chain, the security of your credit card is compromised. And that credit card is also stored at many of the points of transit. It is stored for historical purposes, which is a terrible idea. Because that creates a centralized treasure trove, a stash for hackers to attack. We have seen this happen again and again. In the U.S., Target, Home Depot, two very, very large retailers have had incidents where they had 50 to 60 million credit cards stolen. Uh, J.P. Morgan Chase had 75 million accounts compromised recently. All of these things are not happening because these companies are delinquent in protecting credit cards. There are really two types of companies out there. Those that have failed to take the necessary action to secure the credit cards that you entrusted them with, and those that will soon fail to take the necessary security action to protect the credit cards you have entrusted with them. You have either been hacked or you will be hacked. Those are the two categories. Nobody is immune to this. No one can invent a way to protect millions of secure access tokens from motivated attackers. It is impossible to do. We don't know how to do it. There is no information security trick that can protect for all possible types of attacks. Credit cards are broken by design because the token itself is the secret key. And if you transmit that token, you expose your entire account to risk. Bitcoin is fundamentally different. What I'm transmitting is not the key, but simply a signed message. It is an authorization. And that authorization has two external references. One to where the money is coming from by referencing an unspent output on the blockchain, and one reference to where I want to send the money. By creating a new encumbrance, a new limitation on who can spend the money, usually a public key or Bitcoin address. And that transaction contains no sensitive data. If you steal the information in the transaction, all you know is which address the money came from and which address the money is going to and how much. That's it. The signature reveals nothing. The addresses reveal nothing. There's no identifiers. You can't modify that transaction because every part of it is included in the signature. You can't do anything other than replay it, in which case, if it didn't go through the first time, you are helping the person who signed it to propagate it more effectively into the network. You could take the transaction, you can print it out, you can post it on a billboard, you can shout it from the rooftops. A Bitcoin transaction can be transmitted over a completely unsecured Wi-Fi, by smoke signal, by light signal, with carrier pigeons. It doesn't matter. Nothing in that message can be compromised. But most people don't realize what it means to convert money into a content type. We have taken the transaction, which is just 250 bytes. We have separated from the transport medium, so it doesn't depend on any underlying security. We have made it stand alone, so that it can be independently verified by any node that has a full copy of the blockchain. Independently verified as spendable, authentic, and properly signed by any system that has a full copy of the blockchain. In fact, even by systems that only have a partial copy of the blockchain. And that transaction can be verified in seconds. And all it has to do is reach one node in the network that can talk to miners. That's it. Once it's injected into the Bitcoin network, and once it propagates, you can be almost certain that that transaction will be included eventually and will become valid. If I look at a transaction, I can calculate if it has sufficient fees, and then I can make certain assumptions about how miners are going to treat that transaction because I know the rules by which they operate on a consensus network. 
And therefore, I know that once this is propagated enough, this transaction will appear in a block near you soon. Right? And there's nothing magical in the transaction. So let's think about this for a second. How can you encode 250 bytes and transmit them across the network? Someone recently asked me, and I get this question a lot, can't tyrannical governments ban or block the transmission of Bitcoin transactions? And the answer is no, but I don't think people quite understand why the answer is no. So I'll give you a couple of theoretical examples to show what I mean. My first ridiculous example is the encoding of Bitcoin transactions as emoticons or smileys in Skype. Skype has a 128 character emoji alphabet which allows you to send various frowny smiley faces, thumbs up, thumbs down, sunny days, beating hearts, birthday cakes, you know, all of those kinds of things. Now, let's look at that from an information content perspective. That's a character set, right? So, if I'm a computer scientist, I look at that and I think, okay, I now have a base 128 encoding. I have 128 characters. That's a base 128 encoding. That's a really efficient encoding scheme. Right? Bitcoin address is a base 58, and you can fit 256 bits in just 33 characters. A base 128 encoding would allow me to send a 250-byte transaction in just over 15 characters. 15 smileys. A Bitcoin transaction is 15 smileys. I can literally, mathematically, I can write a little script. It's two lines of Python, probably. If you're really efficient, it's probably one line. No libraries needed. Where I can take the hexadecimal representation of a Bitcoin transaction, 250 bytes, and encode it in 15 of one of the 128 possible emoticons. I can then type that into a Skype window anywhere in the world. And as long as the recipient who receives that string of 15 smileys types it into a decoder script and then simply injects it into the Bitcoin network, that transaction will go through. The recipient could be a robot. The recipient could be an automated listening station that is designed to take 15 character smileys on Skype and transmit them onto the Bitcoin network. Now explain to me how anyone can make that stop other than by shutting down Skype. And if they shut down Skype, I'll use Facebook. And if they shut down Facebook, I'll use Craigslist. And if they shut down Craigslist, I'll put my transaction in a TripAdvisor review. And if they shut down TripAdvisor, I'll post it as a comment in the history of a Wikipedia article. And if they shut that down, I'll post it as the background of a JPEG image in my holiday snapshots. <laughs> Money is now completely disconnected information content. There is absolutely nothing you can do to stop information from traveling from anywhere in the world to anywhere in the world when you have an abundance of fully interconnected multimedia communication mechanisms as we do today. But let's say we didn't have the internet. So I came out with an even more ridiculous harebrained scheme, which is the transmission of Bitcoin transactions over shortwave frequency hopping burst radio. So this is if you want to go completely guerrilla style. The Second World War, in occupied France, the Allies dropped thousands of shortwave radios, complete kits with little parachutes from airplanes so that partisans on the ground could hide these in barns, in tree hollows, in abandoned buildings, under bridges, and use them to communicate with various Allied command centers around Europe, from right under the nose of the occupying Nazi force. And 
One of the things about shortwave radio is that not only do you have enormous range, but you can also, you know, in certain frequencies, bounce off the stratosphere. And at the time, they used this for voice communication or coded numbers communication, right? So Morse code and various one-time pad encryption schemes. So I'm going to make it really, really simple. Nowadays, I can go out and get a kit that allows me to connect a very simplistic shortwave radio transmitter to my laptop via USB. Now all I need is an antenna. Now the nice thing about that is that in shortwave radio, an antenna consists of a sufficiently long piece of metal, a railway line, a clothes line, a broken down electricity line, a fence line, a razor wire fence, which I notice in New Zealand you have lots of. Right? It's right around those fuzzy white things that are everywhere. <laughs> so now the transmission of a Bitcoin transaction involves plugging in a laptop, attaching it to a fence post, pressing enter, and transmitting a burst transaction for 25 seconds. And as long as there's a receiving station somewhere within the surrounding thousand miles, that is connected to the Bitcoin network, and you can hide the receiving station anywhere you want. It's a passive listener; it can't be triangulated. It can inject the transaction into the network. So now, if I'm a gorilla and I want to buy something, I construct the transaction offline, and when I'm ready, run out into the middle of the field, clamp my transmitter onto a clothesline, press enter, transmit for 25 seconds, pack up my gear, and disappear into the forest. How the hell do you stop that? You don't. That's the simple answer. You don't. But that's just the beginning. Because once you realize that money has become a content type, transactions have been disconnected from the medium, some really important secondary characteristics emerge. You see, the thing is, the medium is the message, as someone famous once said. And the primary reason the medium is the message is because the medium constrains transforms and in many cases distorts the message when your medium is tv your message is 18 minutes long interrupted by advertising slots that is your message there is no other format you can fit there right so you make a message that fits that medium and you start assigning the value of your message based on the mistaken assumption that it is equivalent to the cost of production. So, TV, for example, imposes a certain cost to producing video. And people who are in that business make the mistaken assumption that the cost of producing TV is the same as the value of that show. The more you spend on it, the more valuable it is. So you can imagine their horror when something like YouTube comes along and drops the cost of production to zero. Now, what do you think is the immediate assumption that people make in that industry? If the cost is zero, then the content is worthless, right? And that is a fundamental misunderstanding of what happens when you separate the content from the message, uh, from the medium. When you separate the message from the medium. Because what it does is it shifts your perception of value from the cost of production to the value it has to the consumer when they consume it. Let me go to an even older example. When the cost of printing is astronomical and the means of printing are available only to a select few, the only thing you print is Gutenberg Bibles. The medium defines the range of expression of the message, and constrains it only to the most grandiose and important messages that society has. It limits the range of expression by imposing enormous cost of production. What do you think Gutenberg would have thought of Twitter, which takes the cost of production to zero, makes it available universally, ubiquitously, and for free, 
And so you go from printing the Gutenberg Bible to responding to a tweet with one of my favorite expressions, which is the three-character opinion SMH, which means shaking my head. So when Professor Bitcoin says Bitcoin is going to zero, I can express my entire range of opinion and thoughtful analysis as <laughs> three characters, and I have expressed my opinion to the world. Now, if you look at that from an objective perspective, surely that message is worthless. And so you make the mistaken assumption that if the cost of production is zero, and the message appears trivial on its face, then the entire combination of medium plus messages must be worthless, must be trivial, must have no value. And that's a mistake that people have made at every turn in history. So when Twitter first came out, people assumed that it would only be used for the trivial. And yet, a year ago, I was watching CNN International covering the Egyptian Revolution, and they're live streaming tweets from Egyptian revolutionaries on the streets of Cairo, giving live reports about what is happening minute by minute. And the CNN anchors are doing nothing. They are pointing at the screen, showing the tweet. Look, oh, we have another tweet. And, and here is another tweet from someone we don't know. And here is another tweet. They have been reduced to the role of a TV show model going, and this wonderful refrigerator will be yours if you win the prize behind door number one. Which you know, I find extremely gratifying to watch one of these uh, talking heads like Anderson Cooper, uh, basically reduced to reading tweets off a screen. Because they mocked it. Because they made the mistaken assumption that if the cost of production is zero, then the value of the message is zero. They confused the medium for the message. They made the mistaken assumption that their control over the medium was the source of quality. And long after quality disappeared, they clung to control and thought that control was the only way to achieve quality. And if you remove control, you remove quality. And that is stinky unabashed elitism at its absolute worst. It assumes that the gatekeepers are the source of quality, and all they are is gatekeepers. They assume that the fact that they have the expensive medium means that the message is worth listening to. And the moment you tear that message away from the medium and you open it up to an entire range of expression, yes, it will express the most trivial messages of your culture including SMH, but it will also express the most interesting messages of your culture eventually. Today, in U.S. schools, children read the Federalist Papers, which are letters of correspondence exchanged between Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, and many of the other founding fathers. In a hundred years, people will be reading the Federalist tweets of the Cairo Revolution. That is not an insane idea. That is the path of human civilization. We have seen this happen again and again. So now they mock Twitter as trivial, because they don't understand the distinction between message and medium. But TV was much mocked as a trivial pastime, because it obscured the art of cinematography. And cinematography was a trivial pastime, because it cheapened and vulgarized the art of the theater. And the theater was a vulgar and cheap pastime of Victorians, because it trivialized the great dramatic plays of the Romans and the ancient Greeks. And you keep going down this path, and you eventually arrive at Aristotle, saying that philosophy is dead, because nowadays the kids all want to watch dramatic presentations instead of reading their philosophy books. 
He probably complained about the long hair, too. Every generation mistakes the medium for value and considers the next iteration of the medium that widens access, that opens availability, that broadens the range of expression. They consider that medium trivial, vulgar, cheapening the message. But what they don't understand is when you cheapen the medium, you release the message and you elevate it. And you are able to now express a broad range of messages. And yes, the first ones will be trivial. And the reason they will be trivial is because the previous medium didn't allow that expression. It didn't have within it the ability to have that expression. So yes, the, you will have the SMH, but you'll also have live tweets from the Cairo Revolution. And by the time they figure that out, the new medium is the quality message. And we can turn around and call the next one vulgar and cheap. Money is a content type, and we just wrenched it free from the medium. And the medium has been a series of interconnected networks that segregate money by size and recipient. We have payment networks for small money, we have payment networks for large money, we have payment networks for fast money, we have payment networks for slow money. Payment networks for businesses to pay businesses, payment networks for governments to pay governments, payment networks for consumers to pay businesses, and payment networks for consumers to pay consumers. Oh wait, we don't have those. We don't have payment networks for consumers to pay consumers. We don't have payment networks to do small payments, because the medium does not allow that range of expression. Because I cannot send you 20 cents across the world from one individual to another individual, because the medium constrains the message, because the cost of production does not allow me to express that range of transactional expression. But now we have separated the message from the medium. We have created money as a content type, and that money is now able, at zero cost, with zero production cost, to express the entire range of transactional expression, from the tiny to the enormous, from the consumer to consumer to the government for government. What happens next? The gatekeepers tell you that this network is not serious. The gatekeepers confuse their payment network cost for the value of their service. The gatekeepers of the old payment networks will tell you that this new form of payment is vulgar and cheap. And it is something that is only used for trivialities. And all of the very, very serious people will remain on the solid quality payment networks of the past. Because if they can control and restrict the range of expression, they think that means it's quality. And it's not. It's just an inflated cost of production. It's bare, naked elitism at its worst. They clung to the, to the they, they cling to the uh, medium and fail to see that now the message can be transported over any medium at zero cost instantaneously. So what is the first use of this new model? What is the first new use of this new messaging medium? Now we can send Trivial payments. I get tips on Twitter. Great. I mean, that's a demonstration I can make, which clearly shows people the difference. I can do something I could not do before. But to most people, that's trivial. To most people, the fact that I'm showing them the bottom of the range of expression simply reinforces the idea that this is a cheap and vulgar medium, because what they fail to grasp is that this medium is not just for the trivial. It spans the entire range of transactional expression from the trivial to the enormous. So one day, a country will pay its oil bill on the blockchain. One day, you might buy a multinational company on the blockchain. One day, you might sell an aircraft carrier, hopefully for scrap metal on the blockchain, because the blockchain can encompass the entire range, from the 10-cent tweet 
to the hundred billion dollar debt settlement. We just haven't noticed yet. And it can do so without any constraint imposed by the underlying medium. This isn't just a matter of the fact that the transaction as a content type can be transported over Skype smileys. That's simply a symptom of the fact that we have released all of the constraints of the underlying transport medium. We have made content king. What happens is that when content starts off as the domain only of exclusivity and elitism and limited access, it is used by grandmasters to create masterpieces. The Gutenberg Bible, the first photographs, the landing on the moon, televised for the first time, the great movies of the past, masterpieces made by grandmasters. Then the medium changes because the technology becomes more available. And people start using it for a broader range of expression. But the gatekeepers cling to the old ideas, so they still try to do the grandiose with their medium. They print hardback, heavy cover, leather bound books, Principia Mathematica. And then the medium opens up again, and things become soft cover, and photographs become available to the everyday person in 24 exposures. And the gatekeepers of the past still cling to the past. But now they can't really pretend it's grandiose, so they just do grandstanding. They just say, well, there is a certain je ne sais quoi to film. There is a certain quality to vinyl that CDs will never capture. A TV anchor really has authority. Don't you remember Walter Cron Cronkite? A newspaper is the source of authoritative opinion, and it really is worth the paper it's printed on. Now they're grandstanding. The grandiosity is gone. The quality is gone. Now it's just a matter of clinging to the control and pretending that control is still quality. And finally, in this grand arc of technology, the technology reaches the final stage. And in that final stage, the only people who still believe it's grand are grandparents. In the grand arc of technology, what started out as a masterpiece is now only consumed by those in the last stages of their lives. The first checks written out were used by royalty to fund great ventures like the East India Company to open the spice roads and trade routes to the east. And in those days, only royals had checkbooks. And today, if you go into a supermarket and the grandmother, bless her heart, in front of you in the line, opens up her purse and pulls out a checkbook, 15 people in line are going to groan audibly as they realize it's going to take 15 minutes to write out that transaction. And there's nothing left of the grandiosity of funding the East India Company when you're buying beans and toast with a checkbook in a supermarket. It's the final stage. And the only people watching Fox News now are grandparents, because we all get our news on the internet. What was once trivial is now our source of authoritative news and information. And you can't explain that to the old guard. And we read our books electronically, while some people say, well, there's something about the feel of paper. Yes. It's too heavy to carry 20 books in your bag, and I read 20 books in four or five weeks, and so I need to carry that many. There's nothing about the feel of paper. You're clinging to the past. So, as we move into this world where money is a content type, the gatekeepers of the old payment systems will cling to the illusion the traditional banking is quality, that the gatekeepers are the quality, and the quality is inherent in the gatekeeping, in the control, in the censorship, in the limitations. But that's not where the quality is. And we're going to move on 
and open up the range of expression that is possible with money to unimaginable levels that have never happened before. And they will still cling to their ideas of grandiosity, the great old banks with the vaulted ceilings, and the chromed vaults that are empty, where you can get guided tours on Sundays to look at what banks once used to be like. And you go into cities around the world, and the great vaults of the great old banks are now bars, where you can get a cocktail mixed in the vault. Because banks can't even afford to have those buildings anymore, because they serve no purpose other than grandiosity. And they'll still try to persuade you that through their control, they protect you from evil, from terrorists, from money launderers. What all they're doing is protecting their own incumbency from competition. We have now separated the message from the medium. Money is now a content type, and we're never going to go back. Thank you. I am so happy to uh, be part of this O'Reilly event. Um, I've been a huge fan of O'Reilly as a publisher. If you're a developer and you don't have at least one shelf full of O'Reilly books, uh, you need to try harder. Uh, and I've been a huge fan. And so when I uh, set out to write uh, this book a year and a half ago, first of all, I'd never written a book before, so that was a pretty crazy idea. And then the idea that I could pitch this to O'Reilly and they'd pay any attention was even crazier. And yet here we are, and I can't quite believe it. So thank you so much for coming, and thank you to O'Reilly for trusting in me to, to write this book. But um, I want to make a small correction for the record when the Canadian Senate said that I literally wrote the book on Bitcoin. Uh, that just showed that it also didn't understand open source. Uh, because um, I didn't literally write the book on Bitcoin. I wrote the Bitcoin book with the community's support. More than 150 contributors. The entire book was written on GitHub as an open source project, thanks to uh, O'Reilly's ability to understand the value of that kind of approach. It's been released as an open source book. It's available under a Creative Commons license, and for many people, that means that they can read this book for free and understand this technology without paying a dime. And that's really important because this technology is not just about the develop world. It's very much about the developing world, and we need thousands and thousands of developers to learn this stuff. And so, um, thank you for helping me write this book, if you were involved. I really appreciate it. All right, let's get started. I want to talk about dumb networks. I want to talk about smart networks. I want to talk about the value of open source when it meets finance, and I want to talk about the festival of the commons. So first of all, Bitcoin. Is it a technology? Is it a network? Is it a currency? It's all of the above, even when we end up with a, with a subject for the conference, which is kind of hedging, you know, Bitcoin and the blockchain. If one works, maybe the other will work. Let's try both, see what happens ten years from now. If one of them has failed spectacularly, we had the other one in the title. We got it right. <laughs> Have you noticed that trend? A lot of people are doing that lately, which is... Uh, you know, two years ago, they were saying, this is all a complete joke. It's all just a whole pile of BS. It's a Ponzi scheme. It's a crazy libertarian dream. And of course, that message started becoming less and less credible as this little relentless anomaly of technology refused to die. Despite the dozens of obituaries written about Bitcoin, it refused to die. So the message, this is all BS and it's going away started sounding not so credible. So now we've got this triangulation of the message. The media is refining the message. They're saying, well, yeah, the currency is a joke, but the technology, I don't know, maybe there's something there. Give it two more years of relentless anomaly refusing to die, and maybe they'll start paying attention to this, uh, particularly if it's gobbling up a couple of billion dollar industries and really disrupting the competitive landscape. So, Bitcoin is a currency, Bitcoin is a network, Bitcoin is a technology, and you can't separate these things. A consensus network that bases its value on the currency does not work without the currency. 
you can't just do the blockchain without a valuable currency behind it. And the currency doesn't work without the network. And so Bitcoin, in the end, is both. It is the convergence of a participatory consensus network and a global borderless currency that is fungible and fa fast and secure. But I want to talk a bit about uh, the network and focus on one concept and make some parallels to the early internet. Bitcoin is not a smart network. Bitcoin is a dumb network. It really is a dumb network. It is a dumb transaction processing network. It is a dumb network for verifying a very simple, very, very simple scripting language. It doesn't offer a complete range of financial services and products. It doesn't have automation and incredible features built in. It is simply a dumb network. And that is one of its strongest and most amazing features. Because when you design networks, when you architect network systems, one of the most fundamental choices is this. Do you make a dumb network that supports smart devices, or do you make a smart network that supports dumb devices? Now, you are probably familiar with some smart networks. I'll give you an example. The phone network was a very smart network. The phone at the end of that network was a very dumb device. If you had a pulse dialing phone, that thing had maybe four electronic components inside it, and it was basically a switch on a wire with a speaker attached to it. You could dial by flicking the hook up and down fast enough, right? Because it was a dumb device. It had no intelligence whatsoever. Everything the phone network did was in the network. Caller ID was a network feature. Call waiting was a network feature. And if you wanted to make the experience better, you had to upgrade the network, but you didn't need to upgrade the device. And that was a critical design decision, because at that time the belief was that smart networks are better, because you can deliver these incredible services just by upgrading the network for everyone. There's one small disadvantage with smart networks. They have to be upgraded from the center out. And innovation occurs at the center by one player and requires permission. And as a result, innovation only happens when a feature is needed by all of the subscribers of the network, when it is compelling enough to disrupt the function of the entire network to upgrade it. The internet is a dumb network. It's dumb as rocks. All it can do is move data from point A to point B. It doesn't know what that data is. It can't tell the difference between a Skype call and a web page. It doesn't know if the device on the end is a desktop computer, a mobile phone, a vacuum cleaner, a refrigerator, or a car. It doesn't know if that device is powerful or not, if it can do multimedia or not. It doesn't know. It doesn't care. And in order to run a new application or innovate, on the dumb network, all you have to do is add innovation at the edge, because a dumb network can support smart devices. And in order to add new applications and innovation, you don't need to change anything in the network. You push the intelligence to the edge. And now, an application that only has five users can be implemented as long as those five users upgrade their devices to implement that application, and the dumb network will transport their data because it doesn't know the difference and it doesn't care. Bitcoin is a dumb network supporting really smart devices, and that is an incredibly powerful concept, because Bitcoin pushes all of the intelligence at the edge. It doesn't care if the Bitcoin address is the address of a multimillionaire, the address of a central bank, the address of a smart contract, the address of a device, or the address of a human. It doesn't know. It doesn't care if the transaction is carrying lots of money or not so much money at all. It doesn't care if the address is in Kuala Lumpur or downtown New York. It doesn't know. It doesn't care. It moves money from one address to another based on a simple locking script. And that means that if you want to build a new application on top of Bitcoin, you can upgrade the end devices and you can build an application. And you don't need to ask for anyone's permission to innovate. Write the app, launch it on your endpoint, and Bitcoin will route it because it's dumb. And that 
is the power of innovation on the internet. It's innovation without permission. It's innovation without central approval. It's innovation without broad network upgrade. And it means that Bitcoin is not a specific financial network. It's not a financial network for large transactions or small transactions or fast transactions or slow transactions. It's whatever you want to use it for based on what you do at the end point. Now compare that to the current banking system. The current banking system is built around very smart networks, absolutely and tightly controlled to deliver very specific applications to very dumb endpoints. Even with your most sophisticated online banking, all you can do with your bank is access some HTML that delivers a set of services that they decided they were going to give you, with no APIs, and no ability to run additional applications, and no ability to upgrade, or innovate, or change anything, unless the entire network changes to support your new application. And that network is either a network for large payments, or it's a network for small payments, or it's a network for fast payments, but it's not all of the above. And Bitcoin is all of those things, because it's not discriminating, it's neutral, it doesn't care, it's dumb. The power of pushing intelligence to the edge, of not making decisions in the center, moves the innovation into the hands of its end users, and gives those end users the ability to build applications that are so niche that only a handful of people around the world need them. And they can build those applications without asking for anyone's permission. But there's one more thing that's really unique about Bitcoin, and is one of the reasons that it continues to survive and continues to win over the centralized, closed networks of the past. And that is that Bitcoin is open source, open standard, and open network. One of the key concepts in economics is the idea of a tragedy of the commons which is when you have a common resource that can be consumed without limits by all those who participate until it's depleted and the entire system collapse a form of market failure called the tragedy of the commons and the most common example of that is the commons in the old british sense of a large grassy area that you have a field that everyone can graze their cattle on. And if everybody goes and grazes their cattle with reckless abandon before long, you have a big muddy pit and no cattle, uh, because everybody overgrazes it until that resource is depleted. Bitcoin doesn't suffer from a tragedy of the commons like most financial networks do. I can't innovate on somebody else's network. When Visa innovates, only Visa wins. When MasterCard innovates, only MasterCard wins. If a feature is deployed on Swift, I don't get it as a consumer. If Bank of America makes something new and snazzy, they do it competitively and at the exclusion of every other bank that didn't implement that feature. Bitcoin is a common resource whose use increases the value of that resource at the exclusion of no one. If a company builds a new feature that can be used on Bitcoin under open source licenses, that feature can then be used by everyone in the ecosystem. And that means that it enriches everybody's use. So if a company invests money in Bitcoin, the protocol, they benefit, but so does everybody else. And when they play in the Bitcoin sphere, they get to benefit from everybody else's investment in that space. So it returns multiple times. You get this wonderful synergy where each company that invests in this amazing technology makes it better for everybody else. It's not an exclusionary principle. So instead of a tragedy of a commons, you have a festival of the commons. A commons that gets better with the more companies that are using it. Just look at some of the examples. 2014 was supposed to be the worst year in Bitcoin. And that's only if you are paying attention to the price. Because in 2014, on the Bitcoin network, we saw the deployment of two incredible technologies. The first, multi-sig, which required a tiny change to the core, but then allowed an enormous amount of services and products to be built at the edge. And hierarchical deterministic wallets, which didn't require any changes in the core, and allowed us to have these incredibly complex and rich experiences in the wallet space. The companies that invented and deployed those two features 
did so in 2012, and we reap the benefits today. And on the back of those two inventions, we saw an entire ecosystem of new products and services. The value invested by one company two years ago blows up and creates an entire range of products in a new industry two years later. And in 2014, during the worst year of Bitcoin, 500 startups received $500 million in investment, generating tens of thousands of jobs. And none of that innovation has come back yet, because they just started. Give us two years. All of the incredible technology advancements we saw in 2014 happened from inventions that were done two years ago and just started reaching broad adoption. Now what happens when you throw 500 companies and 10,000 developers at the problem? Give me two years and you will see some pretty amazing things in Bitcoin. And that is the advantage of the Festival of the Commons. So while journalists are writing yet another obituary for the death of Bitcoin, I look at an ecosystem of openness. I look at an ecosystem that is generating jobs in an economy that is mostly dead. I'm looking at an ecosystem that has some of the smartest people I have ever met creating the most amazing innovations. And the really amazing thing about this is that we all benefit from all of this. We're not really competing against each other. When one Bitcoin company builds something amazing, everybody gets the benefit. Bitcoin gets better for everybody. And as a result, we're seeing a rate of innovation that not only is not slowing down, but is accelerating. It's already at breakneck speed, and it's accelerating. You put an open, decentralized ecosystem with the Festival of the Commons, open source, open standards, open networking, and the intelligence and innovation pushed all the way to the edge, so the users have control over what they innovate on, and how they invest their time, and money, and spirit into this technology. Put that against a closed system, controlled by a central provider, whose permission you need in order to innovate, and who will only innovate at the exclusion and competition of all of the other companies, and we will crush them. People ask me, well, what happens if Goldman Sachs builds Goldman Sachs coin? I mean, let them build it. If it's really open and decentralized, they just prove the whole point of this, and we can all go home uh, declaring victory. If it's closed and doesn't allow open innovation, it will become stagnant in just a few months, while we continue accelerating ahead with more and more innovation, feeding off each other's invention. You cannot stop this. So that's why I'm excited to be in the Bitcoin space. A dumb network that puts all of the intelligence and innovation at the edge, so that we can innovate without asking anyone's permission, and we can participate in this incredible festival of the commons. Thank you. So uh, we have a bit of time for Q and A, and I would love to take audience questions. Um, we don't have any microphones, but if you shout your question, I'll try to repeat it uh, for any recorded sessions. Anyone have any questions for me? Yes. What are my thoughts on side chains? Um, side chains is a proposed mechanism for being able to transfer value from one blockchain to another in an automated fashion without having to use a centralized exchange, but instead using the decentralized power of the consensus algorithm on each of the blockchains to achieve a two-way peg. Side chains show how far we've come from 2009. Uh, while in many cases, uh, some of Bitcoin's biggest detractors are looking at Bitcoin as it was in 2009, understanding a third of it and coming up with a list of criticisms, we've built a whole new area of consensus algorithms, and new blockchains, new altchains. The innovation is incredible. And one of the things I really like about sidechains is the ability to accelerate that innovation. Because what it does is it allows you to take specific features, perhaps features that would be disruptive, 
um, or that will require uh, some upgrades to the common infrastructure, and test those on a side chain, so you could run a beta chain. You could branch and merge features from one chain to another. You can also experiment on a variety of alternative currencies, alternative chains, and alternative applications, while backing them with the reserve value of Bitcoin, Bitcoin as a reserve currency, and by extension, its security. So you have a secure basis in Bitcoin, you have a value basis in Bitcoin. You can use that to bootstrap young innovations, applications, and chains. One of the big challenges in uh, this area today is that it is very difficult to uh, bootstrap a robust and resilient blockchain and consensus mechanism. You need miners to come mine for you. And if it's too small, it can be attacked, it can collapse, it can suffer various failures. Bitcoin has done that. Rather than trying to replicate that success, sidechains allow us to build on top of that and leverage it to use other applications and chains. So I'm very excited. So far, we've seen a paper. There's a lot of really exciting uh, research, and there's some very very smart people working on developing code. I'll reserve further judgment until I can run that code. <laughs> All right. Questions? Yes. Uh, do I have any thoughts on the role of regulators and compliance and how it can benefit uh, Bitcoin? Yes, I have many thoughts. I have delivered some of those thoughts in less than polite terms in other forums. Um, so I'll keep them a bit more circumspect right now. Um, regulators have failed to protect consumers. Regulators failed to put bankers in jail. Regulators failed to stop fraud and crime on an epic proportions since 2008. We have found out that gold is rigged and markets are rigged, that mortgages were fraudulent and rigged, that entire foreign exchange mechanisms were rigged, and so far no one has gone to jail. The fines that they have charged are less than the profits made from the fraud, and that is a license to continue crime. Um, until regulators start protecting consumers, I don't think they have anything to add to Bitcoin. Bitcoin allows us to do consumer protection by putting control in the hands of the consumers themselves. Bitcoin is consumer protection because privacy is consumer protection. Bitcoin is consumer protection because user control is consumer protection. Regulators, they're just helping banks avoid competition. And as far as I'm concerned, when your press releases are written by the banks you're supposed to be regulating, you should be in jail too. And that was the mild version. Yes. Okay. What do I say to the idea that Bitcoin is essentially a, a trade-off between either cheap transactions or secure transactions, because eventually the reward runs out and you start only getting reward from miners based on transaction fees? First of all, that doesn't happen for 132 years. Um, and as far as I know, in 132 years, we'll be looking at a Bitcoin interplanetary network, and I'm less worried about how we optimize the blockchain today to achieve that. A lot of this is a matter of optimization. And quite honestly, I don't start getting worried about a problem until we start seeing signs of a problem, or even you know, tiny, tiny um, examples of that problem. Part of my experience comes from reading this kind of uh, concern journalism, I'll call it, uh, to avoid calling it concern trolling. But the idea here is that when I was working on the internet, for example, every year, without fail, there was an article that came out that said, Ethernet has hit the limits of physical science and physics, and here is proof of why Ethernet cannot exceed one megabit. And then next year it was, and here is proof of why Ethernet cannot exceed 10 megabits. And a year later it was a gigabit, and a year after that it was 10 gigabits. And every single time there was a Ethernet's about to die. We've seen that with IP that won't 
can't possibly scale. We're going to run out of IP addresses, and the whole thing will collapse. Search that won't, can't possibly scale. We're going to run out of uh, ability to do things, and it will collapse. Storage. You know, all of these doom scenarios they assume the technology is static. They also assume that when you have something of value, there won't be someone to innovate and solve the problem. So to all of these problems, what I see is opportunity. In 1995, every article about the internet said that it would fail because you could never find anything. And some people saw that as a problem, and they did a lot of rending and pulling their hair out and crying that the internet would die. And a couple of guys formed Google and decided to solve that problem. Now they've got a 400 billion industry. So you can either look at it as a problem, or you can say, if I solve this, what kind of value can I generate in this industry? And so far, I have not seen any problems in Bitcoin that are unsolvable. These problems are technical, but they are solvable. The concerns are mostly academic, and the network is incredibly dynamic and resilient. So, in summary, I'm not worried about optimization. I'm not worried about scaling. For every one of these problems, I've seen ten proposed solutions long before these problems are actually real. And uh, I think we're going to see uh, Bitcoin continue to scale, continue to grow, and to adapt to these challenges uh, without any difficulty. Thank you. Let me take one last question. Sorry, I can't see. Oh, there you go. Academic research, yes, absolutely, I see a role for academic research. In fact, there is an online repository of academic papers written for Bitcoin. And in 2013, I think there were only like four or five. And in 2014, there were about 150 papers. I know of dozens of people that are doing their PhDs in Bitcoin. As far as I'm concerned, around Bitcoin, we will not only see academic research and consensus algorithms and distributed computing, I see entirely new scientific disciplines arising out of Bitcoin. Think of it this way. Today, if you want to do macroeconomics, you can study economies on a six-month ex post facto statistical approximation. With a blockchain, you can do computational macroeconomics in real time on real data. Today, if you want to study the activities of an economy, or you can want to study the activities of an industry sector or a specific company for microeconomics, again, you can only do it ex post facto six months later with a statistical approximation. And on the blockchain, you can do computational microeconomics in real time. Big data analytics on the blockchain is an enormous area. Study. For the first time, we can do things as humans where we can look at the economic activity of very, very large populations in the aggregate and mostly anonymous, which is actually a good protection because you can't easily de-anonymize this data. And at the same time, you can gain enormous value. So, uh, yes, academic research in Bitcoin is great, and most importantly, not only is it happening, but I expect new scientific disciplines to arise out of this incredible invention. Thank you. I think we have time for one more, um, if anybody has another question. Yes? The title of my next book? I'm not sure yet, but um, I'm thinking the blockchain design pattern. Uh, I want to talk about the use of uh, the blockchain design pattern as a basis for building a variety of applications. So it's uh, slightly different from my first book, but really an extension. Um, I found out something recently. My sister had a baby. It was a wonderful experience for me as an uncle, first-time uncle. And, uh, she told me right before that she absolutely hated this experience. She hated it. She really, really suffered <laughs> through the whole thing. And then two minutes after the baby was born, she was like, you know, I'd like to have another baby. <laughs> <laughs> and I've heard that that's a common experience for pregnancy. You know, you absolutely hate the entire nine months until the very last minute. You think, why am I doing this? This is absolutely horrible. I'd never do this again until one second after the baby's born. And then you go, yeah, let's have another one. Um, that's how I feel about writing books. 
the eight months run-up to actually publishing was some of the hardest times of my life. It was very, very difficult. I won't, of course, compare it to childbirth. That is really a marathon endurance and uh, amazing, but it, it was really difficult. And when I was doing that, I never wanted to even think about writing another book ever, t ever again in my life. And the day it hit the publisher, I was like, hey, maybe I should write another book. So, thank you so much for your support. Thank you so much for coming. Um, a couple of quick notes. Um, there is also an, a great video series. The gentleman who introduced me, Lorne, uh, has done a great video series on O'Reilly, which is the video training series called Bitcoin and the Blockchain. If you're interested, you can find that on O'Reilly.com. Also, uh, tonight at 7 p.m. at the Internet Archive, the San Francisco Bitcoin Meetup Group is doing a social, a social gathering. And if you like coming to Bitcoin conferences, you know one of the most important things for me is meeting people in the Bitcoin community. Bitcoin meetups are one of the most vibrant aspects of this community. It is a wonderful space to meet other people who are passionate about this technology. Check out the Bitcoin Social tonight at 7 at the Internet Archive. And thank you so much. Open the second hearing of the Senate Economics References Committee into Digital Currency. The Senate referred this inquiry to the committee on the 2nd of October 2014 for report by the 2nd of March 2015. On the 2nd of March 2015, the Senate granted an extension to report by 10th of August 2015. The committee has received 46 submissions which are available on the committee's website. I would like to thank this opportunity to thank those who made submissions to the inquiry and the witnesses who have taken time to appear before the committee uh, today and at the previous public hearings on the 26th of November 2014. There's a public proceedings or the committee may determine or agree to have a request evidence heard in camera. I ask anyone to, everyone to ensure they have switched off or turned to silent their mobile phones. I ask photographers and cameramen to allow the instructions of the committee secretariat and ensure that senators and witnesses' laptops and personal papers are not filmed. I remind all witnesses that in giving evidence to the committee, they are protected by parliamentary privilege. It is unlawful for anyone to threaten or disadvantage a witness on account of evidence given to a committee, and such actions may be treated by the Senate as contempt. If a witness objects to answering a question, the witness should state the ground upon which the objection is taken, and the committee will determine whether it will insist on an answer having regard to the ground on which it was claimed. If the committee determines to insist on an answer, a witness may request the answer be given in camera. Such a request may, of course, be made at any other time. A witness called to answer a question for the first time should state their full name and the capacity in which they appear. I now welcome Mr. Anton Antonopoulos. For the Hansard record, could you state your full name and the capacity in which you appear? Uh, hello, my name is Andreas M. Antonopoulos. I am an author and computer security expert. Thank you so much, and thank you for taking the extra effort to participate in our inquiry. I want to invite uh, you to make a, a few brief opening remarks, and I think we have a few questions for you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair and committee members. I appreciate this opportunity to contribute to these proceedings about digital currency. My experience is primarily in information security and network architecture. I have a master's degree in networks and distributed systems and have worked in this field since 1992. I spent 20 years working on networks and data, se data centers for financial services companies before I found Bitcoin in late 2011. I have been working full-time in the Bitcoin space for the past two years and written a book for software developers with the title Mastering Bitcoin. Bitcoin's unique architecture and payment mechanism has important implications for network access, innovation, privacy, individual empowerment, consumer protection, and regulation. I welcome the opportunity to talk to you about these issues today. For Australia, Bitcoin represents a unique opportunity in two areas. Firstly, Bitcoin can introduce much-needed competition in the retail payments industry, undercutting the expensive systems offered by credit and debit cards, while significantly improving security and privacy for consumers. Secondly, the Bitcoin industry can establish Australia at the forefront of the next wave of innovation in financial services, a wave that can extend financial services to more than 2 billion people throughout Southeast Asia who are currently underbanked. Just like cellular telephones allowed billions to become connected with the world, entirely bypassing the need for fixed-line telephone infrastructure, Bitcoin can do the same for banking. Australia is already the home of a thriving Bitcoin industry and can become a leader in the region and the world. 
Until the invention of Bitcoin in 2008, security and decentralization seemed like contrary concepts. Traditional models for financial payment networks and banking rely on centralized control in order to provide security. The architecture is built around a central authority, such as a clearinghouse. Those within the center of the network are vested with enormous power, act with full authority, and therefore must be very carefully vetted, regulated, and subject to oversight. Bitcoin is fundamentally different. The security model of blockchain currencies is decentralized. There is no center to the network, no central authority, no concentration of power, and no actor in whom complete trust must be vested. In Bitcoin, security is an emergent property of the collaboration of thousands of participants in the network, and not a function of a single authority. If a bad actor infiltrates a traditional financial network, the network itself and all of its participants are at risk. In contrast, if a bad actor has access to the Bitcoin network, they have no power over the network itself, and do not compromise trust in the network. The Bitcoin network, therefore, can be open to any participant, without vetting, without authentication or identification, and without prior authorization. This freedom of access creates freedom to innovate, without permission from the incumbents, the same fundamental force that has driven Internet innovation for 20 years, creating enormous value for all. Centralized financial networks can never be fully open to innovation, because their security depends on access control. Incumbents in such networks effectively utilize access control to stifle outside innovation and competition, falsely presenting their anti-competitive actions as consumer protection. Bitcoin's decentralized nature affords consumer protection in the most powerful and direct way, by allowing Bitcoin users direct control over the privacy of their financial transactions. Bitcoin transactions never expose vulnerable account identifiers, and Bitcoin users can protect the privacy of their transactions without relying on or trusting any intermediaries. Contrary to popular misconception, Bitcoin is not unregulated. Rather, several aspects of the Bitcoin network and financial system are regulated by mathematical algorithms. The algorithmic regulation in Bitcoin offers predictable, objective, measurable outcomes. Algorithmic regulation provides certainty without nationalist or geopolitical influence. In a time of unprecedented currency wars, mathematical neutrality is a safe haven. In trying to understand consumer protection oversight, audit, and regulation of Bitcoin, there is a risk that many will try to apply familiar models of the past to this new digital currency system. I urge you to resist the temptation to apply centralized solution to this decentralized network. Centralizing Bitcoin weakens its security, dulls its innovative potential, and removes its most disruptive, yet also most promising features. Centralization will disempower its users, while empowering incumbents. Consumer protection will not be achieved by removing Bitcoin's built-in privacy characteristics. We cannot protect consumers by removing their ability to control their own privacy, and then asking them to entrust it in the same intermediaries who have failed them so many times before. In this new decentralized financial network, we have the opportunity to invent new decentralized security mechanisms based upon innovations such as multi-signature escrow, smart contracts, hardware wallets, decentralized audit, and algorithmic proof of reserves. These are the new decentralized regulatory and security tools that are most appropriate for a decentralized digital currency. Thank you for the opportunity to address this committee. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for that fantastic, uh, um, fantastic opening um, statement. I've got a few questions before I get to them. Um, I think Senator Canavan had a few, a few, yeah, a couple of Senator Edwards. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, I want to thank Mr. Ant Antonopoulos for uh, making yourself available. Uh, uh, we recently were in Canada, and 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 I know you've given evidence to to their Senate committee, and they mentioned you as someone who was one of the more impressive witnesses they've had. Uh, so it's uh, fantastic that um, uh, that you've been able to join us as well. Um, I wanted to just really drill down on your last comments there about avoiding uh, imposing uh, old school regulatory models, so to speak, uh, on, a, on a newly emerging technology. Um, I mean, how do we draw the line, though? I've noticed in some of the other comments you've made that there is a distinction between the use of Bitcoin between individuals and uh, on a personal basis almost, uh, and perhaps some of the infrastructure that might grow around Bitcoin, um, including custodial accounts, uh, um, uh, banking type uh, um, services. Uh, I mean, do you still see the need that there is some regulation needed for 
Bitcoin companies that might provide more than just access to currency? Yeah, thank you, Senator. Custodial accounts, as you mentioned, are of particular concern. And in fact, any accounts that take control of Bitcoin keys and therefore remove them from the protection and security of the Bitcoin network uh, create, uh, create areas of centralization. And we have seen before many times that such uh, environments are prone to hacking, theft, uh, and in many cases what we suspect to be embezzlement and insider action. Uh, those types of organizations that have custodial access have all of the problems of traditional centralized financial networks. In short, if you give someone your money, uh, they will run away with it. And so the need for regulation is paramount, uh, and for oversight and audit and all of the traditional financial controls that are imposed in those situations. The key is to recognize the fundamental difference between custodial accounts and decentralized access and control over finance that Bitcoin offers in its decentralized model. So, so say in your situation, I'm sure, I presume you're more familiar with Canada than here. In Canada, would you think it is possible to apply the uh, prudential and consumer protection laws that exist for traditional banks to Bitcoin type banks uh, or digital currency type banks uh, without major modification? Uh, could they be brought into your um, Financial regulatory space quite easily, and treated just as like they, you know, they've got to have they've got to have reserves to against um, against uh, liabilities uh, and deposits. Um, they they need to provide consumers with product disclosure and all those aspects. Could that happen? Could we do that easily? Um, I am more familiar with the United States okay. regulatory well, framework. Any, yep. Okay. And. And I would say that uh, many of the existing regulations uh, apply quite comfortably to Bitcoin. Uh, it can be treated similarly to any foreign currency bro brokerage account yep. with all of the requirements that come from the use of that type of uh, instrument or account system. However, uh, there are some unique uh, things that can be done in the Bitcoin space that can be done in traditional financial environments. And I think there is an opportunity to take advantage of those. For example, in a traditional financial institution, internal audits and third-party audits must be used in order to prove uh, reserve adequacy. Um, and, and that is subject to uh, manipulation and, in fact, can be uh, falsified if the auditors are not uh, eagle-eyed. We've seen, in fact, uh, several scandals, especially in the United States, where the auditors were complicit with financial shenanigans uh, leading to falsified audit accounts. Now, uh, in Bitcoin, mathematical proof of reserve can be um, created whereby uh, the reserve accounts of Bitcoin of each and every participant who has a custodial account on the service can be added up. And the, that result can be verified independently by each customer without revealing anybody's balance. So there are some unique cryptographic solutions uh, that are very innovative and would allow for much more flexibility. Uh, so do you um, see at the moment in the United States uh, companies offering fractional reserve banking uh, for Bitcoin? Uh, um, I hope accounts. not. In fact, <laughs> um, I, I believe that most of the things we see in the United States are not fractional reserve. They're full reserve right. um, situations. In, fra in fact, in Bitcoin, there is a, a very, very high risk with uh, fractional reserve arrangements because of the fixed nature of the currency and the inherent volatility mm -hmm. and exchange rate risk. Uh, such, a, such a scheme would be very dangerous. Now, the problem is whether these organizations can in fact prove that they have full reserves or not. Uh, and that is a question that still is not answered to the satisfaction of most consumers. I think the other thing to note uh, very briefly is the potential existence of hybrid models. So, accounts where, uh, which appear on the surface to be custodial, uh, but in fact where the exchange or bank or financial institution only has control of a minority of the keys in a multi-signature environment. In that case, uh, a financial institution that has, say, one key out of three uh, can uh, authorize a transaction and sign for it, but cannot uh, do so on their own. They, they need a second signature from another key. So those hybrid environments require special uh, consideration as well, because uh, they offer all of the flexibility of uh, 
of managed banking and financial services without any of the risks of custodial control because quite simply the bank can't run away with the money. And, and just my final question on this topic, uh, in the Nor Northern American Bitcoin industry, are they, are they calling for or do they want um, to have uh, the, the, um, your, your financial regulators have oversight over them? Do they want that third party assurance from the government to say, uh, um, I've forgotten the name of your security commission um, in there in America, um, sorry, SEC, the SEC. Yeah. Do they want the SEC to come and give them a stamp of approval so they can go to market with that? Uh, some companies certainly are asking for regulation and oversight in order to provide certainty. However, uh, one of the major challenges in the U.S. and one of the reasons that this is such a, um, a challenging environment to operate is the overlap between federal, state and local regulations. Uh, money transmitter licenses are regulated on a state level, which exposes companies to 50 different licensing requirements in 50 different states. Um, between the SEC, uh, the Financial Crime Enforcement Network, FinCEN, uh, the Department of Justice, the Department of the Treasury, state regulators, uh, banking institutions, FINRA, uh, and various other organizations. There are probably two dozen different regulators all jumping in and trying to uh, regulate or not understanding uh, Bitcoin at the moment. So one of the big problems uh, occurring in this jurisdiction is uh, fragmentation and overlap of, of uh, jurisdiction. In fact, that's why environments or uh, jurisdictions that can offer uh, much more clarity in regulatory affairs and, and less of a quilted environment will actually uh, have an advantage for, uh, versus the United States. So if I can just ask one follow-up there, do you think Australia has that potential advantage? Um, well, I would have said that several months ago. Um, however, I believe that uh, recent decision applied uh, sales tax to every Bitcoin purchase and sale which I think uh, fundamentally misunderstands the nature of the system, ascribing it the properties of a commodity, which it is not, and as a result, adding significant friction. So that may be a, a major disadvantage for Australian Bitcoin companies. I'll leave it there, Chair. We might follow up on that later, but I'll hand back. Yeah, look, um, um, Mr. Antonopoulos, today, so far, kind of the way we've kind of conducted these hearings, we, we had um, a group of people from the industry uh, come and speak to us and kind of talk about the potential and the opportunities and, and the growth potential. Today, after we hear from you, we're going to have the Australian security agencies in, so our equivalent of you know the kind of the, uh, the for, you know the equivalent of kind of the FBI and that uh, our equivalent. We have the Australian Federal Police, the Attorney General's Department, and the Australian Crime mm -hmm. Commission coming in next. Now, they seem to kind of regularly cite uh, this FBI report that I think was done in about 2011 uh, regarding the kind of security kind of concerns regarding uh, Bitcoin. Um, I just wanted to get, before they kind of come in, I wouldn't mind getting your take uh, from on those kinds of security concerns, because obviously they're going to be coming in, I think, presenting a, a view of the, the security risks associated with it. I wouldn't mind getting your take on that. And I know it's not the area you've kind of specialised in, but I wouldn't mind picking your brain about uh, how legitimate some of these concerns are and how much of them are, are overblown. Could you be more specific about which security concerns you refer to? I'm not sure I'm familiar with the specific FBI report. Um, look, largely, the, the concern that largely has, has been expressed, and again, I'm, I'm paraphrasing the, the words of others here, from the security agencies has been effectively, this is something that gets used for dark and horrible things on the internet. This is used for drug trafficking, for terrorism financing, and the, the lack of controls that they have as opposed to other currency exchanges means that there are greater risks associated with this than there are with other uh, matters, and as a result, um, I think there's a hesitation for the security agencies to create a framework where these industries can grow. Uh, very good. I, I think really that that argument in, in my mind is false, and I'll give you a number of reasons why I believe it's false. First of all, it's an argument that we've heard before. In fact, we've heard it extensively about the Internet itself. Uh, the Internet in the early 90s was seen as a den of pornographers, thieves, and terrorists. And, uh, you know, all kinds of horrible stories about how the future would unfold. The truth was that as it gained mainstream adoption, it reflected the desires and needs of mainstream society. Most people are more interested in posting videos of their cats uh, than using it to communicate with terrorists. Uh, the truth is that people will use Bitcoin 
um, to feed their families, to send their kids to school, to pay for health care, um, to get their payroll. Uh, and they will do so because uh, as it grows mainstream, so does the use of this uh, currency. The currency itself is inherently neutral. I think there's also a, a massive misconception about uh, the, this idea that uh, Bitcoin is anonymous. Uh, in fact, uh, Bitcoin is not anonymous. Uh, what it doesn't offer is uh, a totalitarian model of surveillance where every financial transaction can be tracked from origin to destination without suspicion, without due process, without reason to suspect, treating everyone as equally guilty in engaging in financial transactions. In fact, we have seen in specific prosecutions, especially here in the United States, that when uh, calls for concern or suspicion uh, exists and due process is followed, the Bitcoin ledger actually offers a forensically accurate uh, registry of every transaction that has happened, which has been used very effectively by law enforcement. So, traditional law enforcement practices of using informants uh, and constructing trails by collecting information uh, through due process and warrants are much more effective in the Bitcoin environment. Uh, let's take, for example, a transaction that involves multiple parties involved in a conspiracy in a traditional financial network. Uh, in many cases, that will involve wire transfers across multiple jurisdictions. Collecting a forensically accurate trail of these requires serving subpoenas in multiple jurisdictions with the collaboration of Interpol and related agencies. In Bitcoin, you just download the blockchain onto your laptop, and you have a forensic trail of every transaction that has ever happened. So all you need is a thread, one thread to pull, and through due process to be able uh, to uh, link that to an identity, and you will be able to see a full list of all the transactions that has happened. And law enforcement has had no problem using those techniques uh, to deliver prosecutions in the U.S. using Bitcoin as evidence. So I think the, uh, the fear is very overrated. In fact, when I speak to law enforcement agents, they think that Bitcoin is a rather benign a form of digital currency. There are others that are much stealthier, uh, much more anonymous, and in fact may be encouraged to grow if uh, onerous legislation is passed. Now, uh, certainly Bitcoin has been used uh, for criminal purposes. That is uh, a fact. Uh, if, uh, to, to use a, a slightly humorous analogy, it has come to my attention that the vast majority of criminals also use shoes. Uh, that doesn't mean that shoes are the problem. Right? Um, Bitcoin is money. It is a means to an end, and the end to which it is put uh, will depend on who is using it. As it becomes more mainstream, that use will gradually change and obviously become much more benign. It is natural that in an environment where uh, cash is used for the majority of criminal enterprise, a form of digital cash, which offers lower friction, will be attractive to certain elements. Um, but I think if they make the mistake of thinking it's anonymous, uh, they will find out very soon it is not. What Bitcoin is, is it is resistant to totalitarian and holistic surveillance, and I think that's a good thing in a democratic society. I'm just trying to square that, though. You're saying it's resistant to totalitarian surveillance, but you, you can download the entire blockchain onto your laptop. Now, I, I'm, I don't understand all the cryptography behind this, but presumably uh, governments who employ very smart people uh, could find a way to, to, to still um, survey uh, all of our transactions if we were all using digital currencies. Is that not a, not a risk? Um, Given they're all uh, certainly out there. The, sorry. Certainly, the transactions can be uh, surveyed, but they cannot be attached to identities. And in most cases, in order to attach it to an identity, you need to do something else. Usually, that involves uh, seizing equipment from the person of interest, uh, and that would require due, per, due process action of a court. Mm -hmm. So, so it, it works pretty well in terms of the difference between secrecy and privacy. Really, privacy as an individual right can be maintained, while secrecy overall cannot. Uh, on Bitcoin, it is much easier to achieve radical transparency than it is to achieve radical anonymity. And again, uh, Bitcoin cannot be seen on its own uh, without the context. And the context is 750 other digital currencies that have been created in the last two years based on that recipe, uh, many of which are much more anonymous, much more stealthy than Bitcoin, and which will continue to thrive uh, regardless of what regulation is placed on Bitcoin. In fact, if anything, the risk is that Bitcoin uh, 
can be pushed into a corner, very much like the uh, music industry pushed Napster into a corner and ended up with uh, uh, much more troublesome uh, file sharing networks as a result. Um, do you think, uh, I mean, even if we decide that this is too risky, that uh, it creates too great a security threat and we wanted to try and stamp it out, uh, where are we? we can only pass laws for Australia. How effective can we, even if we were in coordination with other countries, stop digital currency? I mean, where is it located right now? Presumably it can always go to a country where there, is, there aren't regulations and, and those that are, want to do bad and, and do wrong can still, can still access it. Uh, honestly, Senator, uh, Bitcoin and the decentralized innovation behind Bitcoin have turned money and transactional uh, exchange into a form of information content. Uh, you can no longer stop information from flowing uh, that carries Bitcoin, then you can stop information from flowing that carries a subversive tweet, mm -hmm. as the Prime Minister of Turkey realized recently, or you can stop any other form of information flowing in a free society where the internet is, exists and can be accessed, or even other forms of communication. Uh, Bitcoin will continue to exist, and as long as there are a number of network nodes that support its propagation, it will continue to exist. Uh, regulation of uh, the protocol itself is really not uh, possible at this time. Um, that says you want to jump in? Uh, look, uh, I'll, if you want to continue with that line. Well, <coughs> I, I'm happy to ask yeah. one more question. It, yeah. it's slightly um, uh, moving along um, on the, on the uh, law enforcement front to tax. Um, uh, so not necessarily nefarious or criminal activities. You, I have seen you mention Google, for example, could use Bitcoin to do its payroll all around the all around the world and 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 save a lot on transaction costs. Google, of course, have also been uh, uh, subject to a fair amount of controversy about their how they pay tax and where they pay tax. We have, if they we, pay tax, if they pay tax, <laughs> uh, we have a related inquiry into corporate tax. So, I, I mean, if I don't know if you have any information on this, but. Do you think digital currencies are another order of difficulty for taxation authorities in terms of uh, tracking uh, transfer pricing and uh, related issues about uh, the, the jurisdiction of, uh, of profits? Um, I don't think so. In, in, in the case where services and products can be delivered, um, in, in many cases, from anywhere in the world and payments can be transferred over any network, there's no fundamental difference in using Bitcoin. Um, from my experience, I think it's, it's important to realize that most taxation systems are based on, uh, on honesty and severe punishments right. if you fail to meet that standard of honesty. <laughs> uh, when I submit a tax return, um, my bank account is not audited for every transaction I've made. Uh, that's not how it works. Uh, however, if um, I lie on my tax return and I'm caught, then everything I've done will be audited, including uh, the transactions I've made in Bitcoin, which are available on a public ledger. So again, it doesn't really change the basic um, social contract between a people and their government, which is that most people report their taxes uh, honestly and um, try to get services from their governments in return. Their use of Bitcoin will only increase their economic opportunity to do international trade and commerce with people from other, from other parts uh, of the world, and uh, doesn't, doesn't really change the mechanics uh, of taxation. Um, what it gives is um, it allows an individual to act more like a multinational company in terms of trading internationally, uh, but certainly the unique advantage of multinational companies to tax evade uh, cheat and not pay any taxes anyway, uh, will remain as they are today. Um, uh, sorry, um, yeah, Senator Edwards. Just, um, uh, I know that we're running out of time, but you've just been through the Canadian inquiry. What evidence uh, did you hear in that inquiry that most alarmed you? Um, I, I participated only in a short part of that. Um, and actually, I was uh, very pleased with the outcome of that inquiry. It seemed that uh, the Canadian Senate was uh, very open to understanding the nuances of this currency, to making the type of uh, fine distinctions that are necessary uh, between uh, fringe uses of the currency and the system overall and its behavior, as well as between uh, the types of activities that need to be regulated, like custodial accounts, versus the types of activities that put power in the hands of individual users, um, such as multi-signature technology and individually controlled wallets. So I, I was very pleased with the outcome of that. I don't think anything 
I heard there concerned me. Okay, there's one final question, if it's okay, and then I think McKenna may have a final one as well. Um, you said in your opening statement that it's important to get the balance right between providing a, or I'm paraphrasing part of what you've said, is providing the right regulatory framework um, to provide some kind of business certainty, but at the same time as not stifling uh, the, the kind of, um, I, th I think your words are, the, the attractive qualities of innovation. Uh, I think the, the challenge for us, and I wouldn't mind putting this to you, is how do we get the balance right between uh, what the industry naturally wants, which is some kind of regulatory framework to provide them certainty so that, you know, people like your visas and MasterCards and others start, you know, properly investing into the industry and at the same time not creating too rigid a framework that effectively places um, some of the benefits um, uh, or kind of displaces some of the benefits. So I wouldn't mind, I know you touch on that as being the, the, the kind of the challenge for regulators. I wouldn't mind just picking your brain a little bit on that before, before you leave. Well, honestly, I think uh, one of the big problems in this particular area is that we're dealing with a very disruptive and very fast-moving technology that has only recently emerged into the limelight. And as a result, there is a lot of uncertainty. We don't really know where Bitcoin will be in a couple of years in terms of whether it will be used primarily as a long-term store of value akin to a digital gold for um, transactions involving large parties. You know, uh, or as I would like to say, the, the kind of currency you use to buy aircraft carriers with, or if it will turn into a currency that is used um, for microtransactions and retail transactions and, and consumer online commerce, the kind of currency you buy a cup of coffee, or perhaps filling both of those at the same time. There are many unanswered questions at the moment, and we're seeing at the same time many of the problems or perceived problems in the industry are being solved with innovation instead of regulation. Um, just in the last two years, we've seen tremendous developments in security mechanisms for um, individuals to protect their Bitcoin holdings against hacking and thieves and to allow them to control them directly so that they don't give them to custodial exchanges and other organizations uh, where they can be stolen. So I think probably, as I said at the Canadian Senate, a wait-and-see approach is, is the most likely to be successful. We saw in the early internet, in fact, that the wait-and-see approach allowed the network to thrive and change um, and uh, morph into uh, various uh, different models based on consumer adoption. And Bitcoin consumer adoption has barely started. We don't know yet how the network will reflect mainstream adoption and the values of a mainstream community behind them and what uses they will put to this network. That is the most exciting aspect of this new technology. I would caution one thing, however. Uh, it would have been very dangerous to allow, in the era of the Internet, the phone companies to set the rules by which the Internet would operate. Uh, they would make sure that it wouldn't operate. It was very dangerous in the era of the automobile to allow the railroads to set the rules, yet that's what, exactly what they did in the United Kingdom with the Red Flag Act, uh, which stalled the development of the automotive industry for decades. Um, it was wrong to allow the oil industry to regulate uh, electricity generation in the United States in the early years. The incumbent industry always wants to write the rules for their new competitors and make sure that they don't get a foothold. Allowing Visa and MasterCard to define the rules uh, by which this new payments network will work will ensure that they will write such rules that will not allow Bitcoin to disrupt what is a very cozy, very um, staid and uh, solid multi-billion dollar industry that has been able to shield itself from competition effectively for more than 50 years and which desperately, desperately needs very strong competition right now because it has failed consumers all across the world. Have we got time, Jeff? Yeah, We're a little bit over. Excuse Sorry, me. Um, if, if that's okay, Mr. Antonopoulos, we'll, uh, I've just got two more questions. Um, one, um, in your view, will you know, you're obviously believe that, that, that Bitcoin or digital currency will achieve a, a greater penetration than it is today. Do you think people will move to use financial accounts or custodial accounts so that rather than maintain their own keys and, and, and cash, if you like, on their own computers, do you think they will use third parties to manage that process? And I asked that question related back to the regulatory issue we had before. If they do that, presumably the fingerprints and transparency um, available to authorities now will be not much different from what they currently have with banks. 
I think in some environments they will, and in some environments they will not. Um, in consumer environments where banking relationships exist and when banking relationships can be extended to existing populations, custodial accounts are probably going to be the easiest way to get involved in Bitcoin, which is a shame. Uh, in fact, I'm hoping that we see enough innovation in security and user experience and user interfaces to allow more people to uh, have decentralized control over their money through Bitcoin, uh, because that is the, the best model by which uh, Bitcoin and digital currencies work. However, um, one of the interesting things that will happen, I think, is the deployment of smartphones uh, with digital currencies in places in the world where banking relationships mm. do not exist, have never existed, and cannot exist, uh, simply because of the lack of infrastructure, political turmoil, uh, unwillingness to extend services uh, to billions and billions of people. I am far more interested with the possibility of Bitcoin being used on text messaging phones and very, very cheap Android phones throughout Southeast Asia, throughout Indonesia, uh, throughout China, throughout uh, many of the places that are very close to Australia, where uh, billions of people are currently uh, using very primitive cash-based or barter-based systems of exchange, uh, where the economies are suppressed as a result of that friction, and where a smartphone, of a very simple smartphone or feature phone, could simultaneously represent not just a communication mechanism, but a bank service window, a credit service window, a mortgage origination and credit origination terminal, a Bloomberg terminal, a stock market trading terminal, an import-export business. Uh, I can imagine uh, you know, a kid uh, driving around on a scooter with an Android phone and running a remittances business that can deliver billions of dollars into a local economy uh, with an army of such kids. Uh, in my view, that is the enduring promise of digital currencies. Uh, banking today is available uh, to just over three billion people on, on a very basic level, but only about a billion and a half people have the kind of internationally capable, currency control free power banking that you and I enjoy. And uh, that leaves four to six billion people outside of the loop. And that's where I think digital currencies will be best used. And in those environments, uh, there is no custodial relationship. Those people will hold the Bitcoin directly on their own devices. So, um, my last question, how long do you think it will be before Bitcoin becomes mainstream? Um, the internet took uh, 15 years. Um, cellular telephones took 10. Uh, the web took 7. Uh, I think Bitcoin is going to be um, perhaps even faster. Uh, it depends on what you mean by mainstream adoption. Mm. I already use it, and so do uh, a couple of million other people already. I think uh, we're going to see probably 10 or 15 years before it's used uh, by people who are not technically savvy across, broadly across all of society. Uh, but I think you're going to see significant penetration in the next five years. Okay, thank you, John. Okay, thank you um, so much, Mr. Antonopoulos, and, and thank you again for, for making yourself available. Uh, and I know it's not kind of easy um, with the technology kind of um, uh, and, and that that we had to use to, to make this work. So thank you so much, and I can't thank you enough for, for um, your participation in our inquiry. Uh, fortunately, the phone companies didn't get to write the regulation for the internet, <laughs> and that's why I was able to do this today. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, Good on you. Good luck. Thank Thanks, you, Andreas. Yeah. Long ago, the dangers of excessive and unwarranted concealment, of pertinent facts, far outweigh the dangers which are cited to justify it. Face the facts, join our hands, make a stand. Uh -huh. It's time to gather plans, get the shot, take the chance. Till there is no one left, stay correct to the death. They can't ever break a freedom, we will never let them. The corrupt politics is killing the system. Cynicism is it, and it's everything that you witness. They tell you what to think, make you believe that they're the realness. They feed us full of lies, and yet we always forgive them. Huh? It's all conspiracy, and if you're it in a witch, you're the puppet. The government's pulling strings from above you. It's time for the introduction to truth. Well, let's start a movement. We've all been brainwashed. They believe that we all are stupid. We believe in what we see and whatever I is a hearing. 
But if you look close, listen, gather your own opinion. You'll understand all the lies, lines, and what's between them. This world is not your oyster. This world is a fucking prison. Come on. Happening in our nation, the world will stand up for the fear of assassination. So they strip us of everything. We stand there and just take it. We're scared to make a stand, a false flag operation. Research Illuminati, find out by 9 11. You see, they line their pockets, don't believe the lies they tell us. Find to seek the truth, realize we need to do whatever it is we can to protect our livelihood. It's time for us to do when the conspiracy or not. They owe some explanations to the questions that we got. What are the skull and bones? What is lying beneath all these secretive means? Got you lying between your teeth. What's with the build a burg? I'm burning your effigies. I'm praying a Lucifer. How sickening this can you be? While all of the time, praying you believing in the peace just to keep up appearances within Christianity. Come on. Fight and close the eye and overthrow all these damn secret societies. 